And we're live again with another episode of VMware Today, one of Zentegra's many podcasts with context. Uh, I'm your host, Phil Sellers, and uh, I want to say thank you for taking a few minutes out of your day to listen in with us and talk about VMware, talk about all the changes. It's been uh, a few months since we've posted an episode, and there's been a lot of change going on inside of the VMware world. Uh, and so I'm happy to be back and, and helping our customers navigate uh, through some new packaging, some new changes. Um, you know, companies gone through changes. The way we buy product with them has gone through changes. So uh, we've got lots of things to talk about today. And I'm happy to say for episode 10, we've, we've got some new faces joining us too today. So uh, I want to introduce and welcome uh, one of Zintegra's solution architects, Rob Campbell. Rob, happy to have you on the podcast with us today. Um, hey, Phil. You know, it's it's great to have more people um, joining uh, the force and, and helping us to help customers with their data center problems. Um, Rob, Rob, where do you, um, you, what's your background? I know you, you worked at a, another bar for a while, but uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Rob Campbell, Solutions Architect with Zentegra. I've been uh, I've been working with uh, you know hypervisors and and VMware ever since VMware came out so you know 90s uh, early 2000s all the way through the 2010s till now uh, so about 25 years of of working in uh, virtualization whether it's server virtualization or or you know app virtualization desktop virtualization um, but yeah I've been working. Uh, as both administrators and uh, you know solutions architect and an engineer, uh, so in many many different industries and seen a lot of different types of deployments. Um, but yeah, I'm glad to be part of the podcast. Yeah, well, we're happy to have you because um, you know it, it's I don't know that it's it's the most straightforward time as a VMware customer, right? We we've gone through a lot of changes. There's a lot of things going on that we have to understand and, and talk about when it comes to our renewals and expansions and how we buy things. So I'm happy to dig in on that today. Um, we've also got Nick Russo. Nick, uh, Nick and I have known each other for a couple of years now. And uh, Nick comes from the customer side of the world, but also from the vendor side of the world. Um, Nick, you want to introduce yourself to the listeners? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, Phil. Uh, hey, Rob. So I've, I've done quite some time in uh, healthcare across three different healthcare systems uh, up and down the southeast coast here. And that's where I really got uh, storage engineering, uh, systems engineering, and, and uh, all the hands-on um, architecture infrastructure up and down the stack. If it's in the data center, uh, I've probably had a hand on it across all, all types of vendors. I uh, really kind of honed my skills uh, recently as a solutions architect with uh, with Dell. And, uh, you know, they they keep you on your toes with looking at the competition. So even though it's a specific vendor, you're, you're always touching and working with everything across the board and specific to the uh, today's VMware conversation. I mean, they go hand in hand with VxRail and you don't really see a customer these days without VMware. So. Uh, I'm curious where this new journey is going to take us as, as they uh, craft their bundles in, in different ways and other competitors start to sneak in. Yeah, and, and it's interesting. Your time at Dell was while they were the parent of VMware. And so, you know, there's a lot of close integration, a lot of close things going on within the organization. But we're seeing some of that um, change and evolve um, now that VMware is not uh, owned by a uh, OEM, uh, they're, they're, they're a little more free. And so we're seeing Broadcom make some changes there. Um, as always, we're, we're going to kind of delve into a recent blog post from VMware. So uh, today we're looking at a, a blog post off of the VMware blogs. I'm going to get that shared up here for anybody that's watching on YouTube. If you want to uh, be able to see our rosy faces, uh, you can always catch these on YouTube as well, where you can see uh, us do this live, I guess, live-ish. Um, but, you know, certainly like and subscribe uh, on the Zentegra channel at youtube.com. And uh, you can see more of what's going on behind the scenes. But uh, for those listening on Spotify, Apple, 
podcasts or wherever you consume your podcast, we, we're happy to be in your ears and talking a little bit today. So the blog post for today is going to be announcing uh, VMware vSphere Foundation 5.2 uh, with the new integrated console experience and live patching. It's uh, written by Himanshu Singh uh, from VMware. It was posted out uh, end of June. And so we want to dig in a little bit about vSphere Foundation. And so I think it's worth talking about before we get into this particular blog post, vSphere Foundation something new. So um, Rob, I'm going to throw it to you. I mean, uh, th this is a different package than what we were typically used to buying with perpetual VMware products. So uh, what is the vSphere Foundation? Yeah, absolutely. So we're talking about VVF and not, not to be confused with VCF. So, you know, we've got uh, some crazy acronyms there. So VVF <laughs> is VMware vSphere Foundation. Um, it comes with, uh, we've got vSphere Enterprise Plus. You get vCenter Server Standard. You get uh, TKG for Kubernetes, ARIA. And then you can buy, if you want to, you can buy vSAN as an add-on. Yeah. So there's and a little bit of VSAN entitlement on there, um, but you're right. Yeah. For a lot of customers, they're going to end up buying some additional vSAN capacity too. Um, yeah. You get, I think a hundred gigs per core. Yeah. And there's a, uh, I think there's limiting factors on the core counts. Um, but anyway, we can get into that. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. So yeah. Um, as, as Broadcom acquired VMware earlier this year, this was one of the new packages that they came out with. So traditionally you were able to buy just vSphere Enterprise Plus, but that's no longer the case. You can still buy vSphere Standard or vSphere Essentials Plus. Uh, those are now core-based subscriptions, but now vSphere Foundation is, is really the replacement for customers who were buying vSphere Enterprise Plus before. Um, and you get additional entitlement. So uh, as Rob said, you know, you, you get some of the benefits of ARIA suite, so monitoring, ARIA operations, um, that's all baked into your subscription. And so um, for customers that are going down this path, th these are products you should start to get to know and see if they fit within your enterprise so that you can get the most out of uh, the subscription costs that you're paying. Um, as we, we kind of delve into this particular blog post, uh, a new version is coming out, uh, 5.2. Uh, they've made some changes, and um, Nick, I'll kind of throw it to you. I mean, do you you kind of want to talk about uh, the first section here that, that introduces some of the new highlights and changes for version 5.2? Yeah, absolutely. I think the the first thing that caught my uh, eye was the, the lifecycle manager. Um, it it kind of go down there. Um, a little bit lower in the post, it's one of the first features that they detail. And it, it, it strikes me as very similar. We mentioned um, uh, the integration of different Dell products before the VX Rail and Hyperconverge really got its popularity because of the one touch upgrades and, and life cycle management. So a um, little bit higher in the article there. Um, yeah, I'm but, sure I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. So um, just, just you know, when, when you're looking at it in general, one of the nice things about the Lifestyle Co-Manager uh, was everything is already done for you as, ter uh, as far as interoperability. You know, before you had to make sure that a specific patch or a specific download had to work with your GPUs or your NICs and, you know, what happens if I upgrade everything but this piece isn't compatible and I missed it. So... Uh, it's really nice to have those features listed right there that you know that they're certified if you're going in there. This one's a little bit different where, it, you know, you're, you still have the option of breaking it down piece by piece uh, within the different upgrades. You don't have to do everything all at once. But the fact that they have that management in there, that validation, I mean, that's just going to make everybody's life uh, easier down the line. Yeah, I mean... So you know, there's a graphic here for those watching online. Uh, boost operational efficiency is one of the things called out in it. And I think that that fits uh, like bullseye right in the middle of operational efficiency, right? 
you and I both have spent yeah. a lot of time upgrading systems over the years. And, you know, we, we've been caught in compatibility matrix hell, um, you know, trying to make sure that this product and that product are running the correct versions and the correct build numbers to be compatible against one another. Um, really behind that, VMware is trying to make it simpler to upgrade and to manage their infrastructure holistically. Um, you know, now that you've got a package of, of other products in addition to vSphere, that, that's pretty important because you don't want to manage those individually. You want to be able to, to actually lifecycle all of that together. Yeah. yeah and they, they, they uh, sorry, Rob, they kind of tuck it away, but um, one of the, the biggest lines that jumped out to me was no downtime patching. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They talk about no need to evacuate, uh, you know, maintenance mode, things of that nature. So, I just remember endless nights of uh, moving VMs off of ESX hosts before we could patch. And, and if they're going to get rid of even a fraction of that and it goes as smoothly as they say, that's, that's kind of a game changer. Yeah, yeah. it is. And it's, it's all, it's all part of uh, vSphere 8. So vSphere 8 introduces that and that's part of, you know, that's part of this VDF. Um, but yeah, yeah, as long as, and you can also pre-post firmware as long as the underlying system like Dell or like HP um, is compatible. Yeah, I think live patching is is a huge step forward. Um, that's a differentiator. I haven't seen that elsewhere in the market. Um, you know, I, I will say that there is a line in this that scares me a little bit. This action's non-disruptive for most virtual machines. So, you know, again, I think there'll probably be some uh, some considerations as you try to do this live in the system. Um, I, I can't imagine most administrators are gonna do it their first time during the business day. They'll probably test this after hours during a maintenance window. But, you know, the, the fact that I know in history, we had the same sort of warning around the emotion, and now we just let the emotions happen anytime on their own, completely uh, managed by the infrastructure. I think this is a great path to see the VMware products on uh, because it does help us avoid those. I mean, either you guys enjoy getting up at 2 a.m. to do those god awful updates. <laughs> oh, no. But we've done our fair share of it, right? Um, yeah. So, so it's interesting. I mean, uh, this section talks a little bit about it. Uh, it's a fast suspend resume FSR, part of the host remediation process. Um, the host enters a partial maintenance mode. A new mount revisions loaded and then patched, and the VM is then fast suspend resumed uh, to consume the patched mount revision. Um, that's it sounds very um, Star Wars to me. <laughs> I, I gotta say, it's it's definitely a little out there, but you know, I'm I'm excited to try this out. Yeah. It does so sound. other features uh, here in new version: uh, supercharging workload performance, accelerating innovation, and elevating security. Um, Rob, you want to kind of go through these top highlights that they called out here in the first section? Yeah, where is that? Yeah, it, uh, I've actually got it on screen if you see it up. Okay. Yeah, so consolidated diagnostics, single sign-on, um, centralized certificate management, uh, unified licensing. Um, I mean, one thing that they don't really call out here is where you're talking about supercharged workload performance. Um, DPUs, DPUs yeah. are now supported with, uh, uh, vSphere 8. So not, I think that's, just one, but two. That? not just one, but two now. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So you can get your NVIDIA DPU and put it in there and, and you can install ESX directly on it and it becomes its own entity inside the machine. Um, you know, that's super cool. So you could put, um, I, I guess, NSX or something on that. Mm -hmm. It's like a mini host inside your host. Um, yeah, uh, what, 
When first released, uh, they limited it to doing DSAN and storage operations, if I remember right, uh, okay. with the promise of being able to do other functions. But you know, offloading those things so that they're not taking your CPU cycles away from your workloads. I mean, that's a, a huge benefit um, to be able to offload those to you know this ARM-based data processing unit that that lives on the PCI bus, completely its own system on a chip autonomously yep. helping you with things like your storage operations. Um, I think that's a huge win because we've always had a little bit of a reservation from folks going, you know, there, there's overhead involved with the hypervisor. Now we're offloading those things uh, to another place so that your primary processors can do great work. And now that we're licensing those by the core, that's certainly a benefit for customers to get the most out of those cores that they paid licenses for. Yeah, absolutely. And because we have these new features in VMware, I noticed that the the hardware, uh, the, the boxes are getting bigger again. We mm -hmm. went from you know big servers down to blades and blade chassis, and now kind of switching away from blade chassis and going to these bigger servers because you need to put these DPUs and GPUs in there. Yeah, I mean, I think those are two huge trends, right? You know, um, we're not talking about it today, but we'll talk about it in a, a near-term episode. There's a lot going on between VMware and NVIDIA around GPUs and AI. So, yeah, we're definitely seeing, you know, the benefits of having more PCI slots, more available places for expansion inside of our servers. Um, you know, the... Um, we, we've talked about the, the new console, easier operation configuration. Uh, we talked about live patching. Um, you know, one of the other places uh, that VMware has focused in this new release is really around TKG and, uh, you know, app services as well. So um, we want to spend a little bit of time kind of talking about that. You know, for a lot of infrastructure people, Kubernetes is still intimidating, something different that they don't understand. Um, and, and I'll say it's been kind of tough adopting TKG because, um, you know, it's very tied to the version of vCenter you're on and, and there's, uh, you know, version eight definitely came out with some new workflows and the ability to make it easier to deploy. Um, but in this new release, there's a new UI, um, the local consumption interface, um, so that, developers get more access uh, and, and direct access to deploy and manage their applications and services. Um, let's talk a little bit about what VVF 5.2 is gonna give for developers. Um, anything that stands out kind of in that regard for you guys? So the, the first thing um, I was gonna ask you guys, uh, so you kind of gave me a good segue here is I mean, what kind of adoptions are you seeing in um, the field as far as Kubernetes and Tanzu? It, it strikes me as funny that they're putting um, TKG in what they essentially are calling an essential subscription, right? You think when you think essentials, you think smaller, you know, sub 1000 VM type environments. And like you said, Phil, people are kind of, um, you know, hesitant to start adopting um, these type of deployments and, you know, let it self-service, letting the customers deploy their own VM, you know, that really starts to uh, kind of make old IT guys pucker up when you're leaving it up to non-IT to, <laughs> to, to get your VMs out there. So I'm just yeah. curious, what kind of customers are you seeing, you know, out there? Obviously, if people say developers, developers, I mean... I've, I've been in uh, very large healthcare systems um, that don't, don't even have one developer on staff, right? right? So who's their target audience here and, and why? Like, what, what are you guys seeing in the field? Yeah. Rob, do you want to take it first? Yeah. So, yeah. So you're talking about more, um, I guess there would be inter internet or web scale type customers that are operating on the internet where they have a, a Kubernetes deployment, they have an application that has, you know, so many nodes that has to scale up or scale down, um, taking that workload away from some type of a, 
you know, some type of uh, base operating system, uh, whether it be, um, you know, a, a website or some type of a, a workload process, uh, moving data from one field to another. Um, you could do all that with Kubernetes, but you can scale it out too, and you could load balance those nodes. Uh, how often do we see that? I, I don't really see it too often. Yeah. Um, usually you're going to have, you're going to have a bigger corporation that has, they, they've made a decision to, to, um, I guess, change their workloads off of, let's say, um, let's say a windows web server or a windows SQL server, and they're taking the application apart, um, and refactoring it. So this is what you would kind of see if you're, if you're using AWS or, or Azure services and you're deconstructing your app. And just getting the bits out that make the app work and putting them into Azure databases and Azure firewalls and, and um, you know, you're, you're refactoring the application. That's what you have to do. You know, that's what Kubernetes is. And you're going to build something from the ground up. You're going to take what you have and transform it. Um, I don't really see too much. Um, don't really get involved in too much of those. Uh, not a lot of our customers are, are using Kubernetes that I've seen. Yeah. Well, it, it's I, mean, I see two bookend use cases, and, and I'm talking to two different groups. Um, one, startups, where they don't have an invested uh, application set, but they do have their own application development. I think you called that out, which is the first insight, Nick. Um, they've got to have their own app dev thing. Mm -hmm. Most ISV software is not written, independent software vendor ISV. Uh, software is not written for Kubernetes today. So most of that still runs in traditional virtual machines. So if you're buying software, it's a lot harder. There's not really a need for Kubernetes. But if you're writing your own software, I am having uh, enough conversations that it interests me. Um, I came from yeah. a shop that was definitely interested in cloud native architectures, being able to do infrastructure as code, being able to uh, package applications dependably and scale them uh, based on metrics and performance. So it does take a rethink. Um, and I think that's part of the complication is you have to retool your people and processes. Um, sure. But it, it's really those startup companies and then the larger organizations with their own application developers where they're writing their own code. Those are the sweet spots. Um, I will say, um, We've helped a number of NSX customers deploy recently and NSX intelligence requires TKG. So that's a change that VMware made um, within the last two years. So we have deployed TKG to support NSX intelligence with a number of customers. And uh, so that's, I think a trend we'll continue to see is more ISV software being written for um, and, and created in that containerized format, but it really, I feel like this has been kind of waiting for the Kubernetes is, is, is sweet for developers, but it's been waiting for that killer application everybody wants that's written in containers. Um, but I'll ask this question. Do you guys think that AI could be that killer application? I mean, it's uh, so, I mean, going back to the adoption conversation, you know, they, they talk about um, in this article, uh, actually, you know, the, the API interfacing using YAML, mm -hmm. right. Um, that's supposedly one of the easier coding languages out there, but you still have to, you know, learn a little bit of context behind it. Right. So if, <laughs> if me as, you know, I picture myself as a sysadmin, having to build, you know, I don't know, a dozen or so VMs a week. If the, the user interface here looks pretty slick, pretty simplified. If, if I could jump on chat GPT and say, hey, write me some YAML code to uh, to build a, v a base VM, you know, with these statistics and everything goes off that. I mean, that's 12 VMs I don't have to build or more a week, you know, that's what's going to easily save you a couple hours in your day for other tasks. So, um, I mean, them throwing this in there almost seems like, why are they making you pay for something you won't use? But if they are, I mean, that might be a real good talking point with our customers to take advantage, you know, of, of this for, 
for simple self-service type type needs. Yeah, I, you know, I, I did a lab around this at an event earlier this year, and um, all of the applications, all of the AI sort of frameworks are written in containers today. So, um, you know, that to me kind of stood out because everybody seems to be really interested in AI and how do I bring AI into the data center and then how do mm -hmm. I, I gain insights and advantage from running AI against my data. Um, that to me makes me think, I don't know, maybe maybe AI is that containerized workload that will drive Kubernetes towards the mainstream, so. Yeah, I mean, before, yeah. um, you know, you couldn't talk about uh, Kubernetes or Tanzu within a vSphere environment without the jump to cloud foundations. Mm -hmm. And that's just, unobtainable from a price point for, for most organizations, I would imagine. Um, so, I mean, if this brings it to a tangible use case, uh, I think you'll, if people aren't jumping on by themselves, it's, it's worth bringing it up. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, you know, speaking of VMware Cloud Foundation, that package has been out for a while. It's sort of the big brother to VVF or vSphere Foundation that we're talking about today. So our next episode, we're going to dig in on what's available in the new 5.2 release of VMware Cloud Foundation. And so we'll, we'll get to dig into more of that goodness and, and talk through some of the features and functionality that you get access to. Um, yeah. Actually, here in version 5.2, there is another big change. Um, you know, up until now, TKG has been tied to the version of vCenter that you're running. And so every vCenter build and release basically has a corresponding version of supervisor cluster and compatible versions of TKG uh, that they can run within the cluster that they're managing. Um, we're breaking that now. So version 5.2, we've got the new independent TKG service that decouples the TKG releases from vCenter. So uh, I think this is a really good thing because um, you know we, we don't typically see a lot of vCenter releases. That's a pretty stable application in my opinion. Um, so I think Kubernetes upstream, the pure open source is changing a lot faster than I would say uh, vCenter is being patched and upgraded. So I think this is a pretty good thing. What do you guys think? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, Rob. Yeah, it is. It is a great thing. So you'd be able to have different versions of TKG mm -hmm. and they can work, uh, and work together. Yeah. yeah I mean, from from a developer standpoint, that's huge. You know, like I said, I haven't been in a lot of environments where they had developers or worked on it, but I know a lot of developers and they're very finicky about their, you know, uh, their release and, and their different code versions. So if, if you have one set that is, is uh, you know, favorable to one, you, know, you can't just tell them you're going to upgrade or else you're going to have a revolution. Right. So let's, let's, let's set up that test, the test environment form the, you know, put this new version out there, test it, and then you can link them together. Yeah, and, and I think that's the thing, right? So TKG service is sort of uh, managing uh, everything. So decoupling that from the vCenter, you can update it independently, uh, gain new access to newer versions of, you know, upstream Kubernetes releases. So it gives you the ability to move forward because I could also see developers asking for new features that they see coming in new releases that you know maybe previously they wouldn't have had access to because that core service was was tied to a particular version. Um, now you know I think it continues to be the case that you know there are three versions of Kubernetes available for each release. It looks like in the diagram here that we've got you know, clusters running on certain versions. And uh, as you life cycle through it, there's a good image that kind of illustrates this. As you go from TKG ver service version 1.0 to 1.1, you gain the ability to run new releases uh, highlighted in green. Uh, but you can also life cycle your existing workload clusters up to newer versions for compatibility because um, we know that uh, 
uh, as it has been, there are three supported versions with each release. Um, so that looks like that stays the same. Um, but there is the ability to asynchronously update the clusters so they can run different versions. And so that may be also really important, you know, as you have applications that have dependencies or as things are deprecated in the future, you may need to run a Kubernetes version for a longer duration uh, while you make changes to the code or make changes to the definitions. Uh, so that that's, I think, helpful from an operational standpoint. Yeah, you can definitely support, get support for a longer time um, as you change vCenter code. Yeah. Um, one other change in the same vein is this local consumption interface. Uh, that's something brand new here in vSphere. It's built into the vCenter interface, um, but it allows this IaaS control plane uh, as part of that, that whole new structure of infrastructure as a service delivered by uh, vSphere Foundation. So again, uh, talking about the YAML code, uh, you know, you can use the interface to generate that YAML code for users. So makes it more approachable, like Nick was saying. And I think that's also a huge benefit because it does take retooling. Um, I'll tell you guys a little story. I mean, before I came to Zintegra, I was working for an insurance company and we set out on this journey right at the beginning of COVID. And, um, it probably took a good year of learning and iterating and working with the VMware team to really get a good handle of how does an infrastructure team become a platform team? How do we adopt Kubernetes? How do we start to answer the questions we need to answer? Um, it's not trivial. It takes time and effort to, to understand for sure. Um, from this, uh, this uh, local consumption interface. Um, anything that sticks out to you guys there that you'd want to talk about? Well, yeah, that... it's, it's writing the code for you. That's very nice. Yeah. Yeah, that was kind of, that was um, what I was speaking of earlier about the si simplicity of that user interface. You know, if, if you could present that to the customer, um, you know, in, in a very easy to use, uh, fashion, you know, it just gives those the IT staff behind the scenes uh, a lot more confidence that they're not going to mess something up, right? Well, and, and I think we should also drill in on something you said earlier too, Nick. Um, it's not just for containers; it's also for VMs. So, you know, typically, when we talked about YAML definitions within vSphere, it's been for containers and Kubernetes consumption. But now they're allowing us to do definitions for virtual machines as well. That could have a really big differentiation for them because you know, we run both. We run container clusters. We run virtual machines in vSphere. But really, there were two different ways of managing and defining those in the past. And now we can do all of that through YAML definitions moving forward. Yeah. So um, I think some of the other features here as we kind of wrap up, um, uh, the boost operational efficiency, uh, Rob, you want to talk about that one? Sure, so this is around uh, alerting. Um, so a lot of times you're gonna have too many alerts. Yeah. Um, so you can, um, instead of having multiple tools, you can uh, uh, kind of you know sift through and, and sort and filter out all the noise um, so yeah, that's a great feature. Yeah, I agree. Get the ones, get the alerts that matter. Yeah. So that you can act on them. Right. I mean, yeah. to me, an alert that you can't act on because you don't trust it is useless. You want to trust your alerts. And so you can't, you can't be inundated by too much noise. Uh, accelerating innovation. Uh, Nick, you want to take that one? Yeah. So, um, Specifically, this is to allow a supervisor on a vSAN stretch cluster. Yeah. And, um, and you're, you're seeing a lot more of that. Um, you know, I, I could remember a day where, where no one had any reliable links between sites. And, and now you're talking about dark fiber. Uh, most, you know, major customers you're seeing and, and, and mid-level doesn't have to just be enterprise. So the active-active um, 
vSphere clusters or, or hyperconverged clusters or anything like that across two different data centers. So instead of that active passive scenario, um, you know, it is, it, it's becoming a lot more popular. So before you're, you're kind of hamstrung um, from a supervisor's perspective uh, on a per site base, but if they're allowing this to go across stretch clusters now, that's just more one more layer of reliability um, you know, in, in your design there. So it's kind of a small bullet point in a larger article, but it's, it could be a big deal, um, to customers who are, are worried about that active, active scenario. Yeah. And, and DSAN in particular, I mean, I think you have a good perspective being a former Dell employee. I feel like, you know, DSAN has been held back. You know, it was owned for a long time by a storage vendor, EMC. Uh, and so, you know, I think so, there have been some artificial sort of limits imposed on vSAN in the past. Now that it's owned by Broadcom, Broadcom management seems intent placing vSAN everywhere. I think same with TKG. Uh, and, and that's probably the biggest point behind this vSphere Foundation package is, you know, they want this enabled and capable technology out to all customers. And, um, so I think this is another example of, of pushing vSAN into more of those mainstream use cases, uh, but also getting it out for customers to, to be able to consume. Um, supercharged workload performance. Uh, Rob, you want to take this one? Sure. So this is what we're talking about earlier with Kubernetes clusters, auto scaling. So you can scale up and scale down the amount of nodes that you need for your Kubernetes cluster as a workload goes up. Um, and then, uh, VGPU heterogeneous profile support. So we all use VGPUs for, uh, we do that a lot with, um, the you know, Citrix workloads, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we have your different sizes of VGPUs and your different profiles. Um, so now you're able to do, uh, all the different, you know, multiple profile types, um, which is, it's, it's a great feature. Yeah, I, I like this one because, you know, I can stack a four gig profile next to a 16 gig profile and run a heavy engineering VM next to a general purpose user, um, you know, maybe just doing, I don't know, some graphic design or something um, without having to dedicate an entire physical card to a single profile, you know, and split it equally. So I think this is a nice, nice to have for a lot of customers. Um, it may also have some pretty big implications when we talk about GPUs attached to AI. Um, yeah. So th this is this is definitely a good good thing. Um, and Nick, well, let's close it out with elevating security. Yeah, it's funny that that's the the what they're calling this topic, and then it just says single sign on, right? Yeah. Uh, but I mean, everybody knows the pain points of having to log on to multiple multiple vSphere products, right? Like back in the day um, when you, you had to, when you couldn't attach any of them. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think this is a given in today's world that they should have already had this, but it's nice to know that it's there and, and you don't have to worry about it. Um, but yeah, elevated security, basically single sign on. Well, you and I broke up, uh, broke up. you and I grew <laughs> up on, um, you know, the ease of use with vCenter, right? You know, I remember vSphere clustering the checkbox, right? You just went in and you checked it and you had a cluster versus yeah. the 20,000 steps you had to do over here to do a Windows cluster, right? Yeah. Um, that was amazing to me. I feel like this is kind of in that vein of simplicity, trying to get the products and make it more manageable and easier to use uh, across the board. So I, I hope features like this, because I agree with you, this is probably something that should have been there a long time ago. I kind of hope this theme continues in future releases and that we see more of those ease of use things come to us uh, in future releases. All right, well, vSphere Foundation 5.2, uh, it was announced in June. Um, there will be more details coming uh, with the general availability in the future. Um, guys, I appreciate you spending some time covering this, talking about it today. Um, I guess as you look at vSphere Foundation, uh, wh where are you on the scale of one to 10? Like, I mean, 
Is this a, a great thing for customers because they're getting access to more things? They're, they're simplifying. Is, is the cost offset worth it? I mean, what, sure. what's your thought opinion right now? So I think we skipped probably one key part of it. And that's the license. So the biggest thing here, the biggest change here is going from perpetual license to a subscription based license, yep. you know, one, three and five years. Uh, it's not per CPU that we're all used to with VMware licensing. Now it's per core. Yep. And there with the, the per CPU licensing, I think it was 32 cores a year ago. Up to 32 cores. Up yeah. to 32 cores. And then there were no there, there were no systems that had 32 cores when they came out with that. So you were safe, right? No matter what you get, you're not gonna have 32 cores. Now they have, you know, some some systems coming out that, that are gonna pass that. Um, so it doesn't matter anymore. You're going to get this uh, licensing now is per core, and there's a uh, 16 core minimum. That's right. Per CPU. So you got two CPUs, you know, each one has 12 cores. You still have to buy the 16 cores. Yep. That host. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I mean, these are, these are big changes for our, our VMware customers. Um, I know it's on a lot of people's minds and um, uh, you know, the, I think a lot of the features are awesome, but uh, it, a lot of times it comes down to that cost um, when making decisions and, and thinking about things with VMware. Yeah. I think that's real talk, man. I, I, I would advise customers listening, anyone listening, get ahead of this early. Um, you know, start talking to your advisors, talk, talk to your value added reseller, talk to someone here at Zintegra um, about what scenario you're going to find yourself in. We have the tools to be able to say, you know, with so many cores you're going to be looking at renewal. We've seen other renewals. We know sort of the ballpark. Let's have a conversation about that so that you know going into your ELA expiration, your vSphere maintenance renewals, uh, what you're looking at. We're, we're here to help. Uh, we'd love to help guide you through that process so that it's not sticker shock when, when you get a renewal quote, um, but you know ahead of time and that we can make plans together to, to help you uh, navigate that the best way you can. And, you know, part of those plans is getting value from the new products. Uh, I can't remember which one of you guys might have said it earlier, but, you know, using what we have access to, whether that's a Kubernetes strategy or ARIA operations or, you know, the vSAN entitlement, um, how do you gain value from the package that, that's in front of you? Yeah, I mean, if you're talking on a scale from one to 10, uh, I got to put myself at a five. <laughs> right. Uh, just because it could go either way. If, if, if you have a customer that was planning on using these features or need these extra features, they're going to be thrilled um, that it's all bundled together. But if, if you have a customer that's on a very strict budget and, and you know, their prices are going to go up, um, the, usually the CFOs aren't looking at it as a nice to have feature when it comes to uh, exceeding your budget. So I think yeah. you're going to see both ends of the spectrum. So uh, I'll take that opportunity uh, to plug a webinar we have coming up in September. Uh, it'll be out on Zintegra.com slash events. Uh, but we're having a webinar and it's called What Now VMware? And um, it really is going to help you dig into that exact topic. How do you get value from it? What is there? What are the alternatives in the landscape? What what can you do? And um, given different case by case scenarios, what is your best option? Uh, for a lot of three tier customers, VMware is still by far the best option for their infrastructure. And so um, if you've got existing investments in storage arrays and fiber channel networks and things like that, we want to be able to help you navigate through this because in my opinion the vmware infrastructure is by far your best in a three-tier posture so uh, i will plug that go out to zintegra.com slash events uh, go ahead and sign up for that as soon as it's available um, but uh, we'll start promoting that heavily and and we'll have that conversation all of us together uh, in september um, so if you're listening and you've got questions around this you can go ahead and email them to me philip with one l 
Sellers at Zentegra.com. I'd love to have those questions and we can certainly start conversations earlier, uh, but I may also build them into to what we're planning to talk about in September too. Uh, any closing thoughts, guys? Um, yeah, I think uh, I, I didn't give my my rating. I would probably say a seven, <laughs> seven out of ten. Uh, yeah, VMware is VMware is a it's a you know excellent tried and true invented virtualization. Um, uh, but there's still if if you don't like the VVF, you can still do VMware standard. You can. It it, it comes with VMotion. I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it comes with vMotion. It misses a couple of other enterprise level features. Um, yep. But we have customers that are choosing to go that way. You know, from a cost perspective, they they would rather be in that boat than um, migrate up. So um, there are options. I, I think that's a good way to to kind of sum that up. Um, yes, Jim. You said it best, uh, Phil, um, you know, get on top of it, have the conversation early. Get ahead of it. Yeah, for, for sure. Um, Nick, Rob, thank you guys so much for joining me today. Look forward to our next episode here in the near future. And uh, for everybody listening, thanks for spending a little bit of time with us and having this conversation. Uh, we'll catch you in the next episode. Thanks.